All right, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, we're on the home stretch. We're down to the last two, and I assure you the last two will be worth your while. They are terrific, terrific players. Uh, but I would like to get a word about our sponsors to thank them once again, the College of Journalism and Communications, the uh, Hugh Cunningham Professorship in Journalism Excellence, and the Gainesville Sun. They're responsible for bringing you this, uh, what I think is a pretty darn, pretty darn good list of speakers here uh, this weekend. So our next speaker is Lane DeGregory, a Pulitzer Prize winner for feature writing. Works for the St. Petersburg Times. She, she and I never work together. How about that? <laughs> How about that? She's the only one, I think, here. They never work together. She uh, won the Pulitzer for a story about a, a young girl, a feral child, who was kept indoors in her room for, what, nine years? Seven years. Nine years. We finally noticed her in the window, and that was the name of the story, the girl in the window. And they'd never seen a kid outside ever at the house. So moving, moving piece, but she, and she's full of life. How about a big one for Lane the record? Hi, this is my assistant Tucker, and my other assistant Rylan was passing out the handouts there. Where's Tucker's gator shirt? I know, well, I went to the University of Virginia, so he's wearing my colors, which are also your colors today. But I was actually born here. I was born here the same, my parents went to graduate school, and I was born here the same year they invented Gatorade. So that's my claim to fame. That's my Florida connection. Um, I've been at the St. Pete Times for 10 years this year. I came from the Virginian Pilot, where I covered everything from commercial fishing to court to school board and very exciting zoning board meetings. Um, most of what I do now at the St. Pete Times is general assignment. I don't have a beat that I cover, which is both good and bad. It's, it's good because you get to write about anything that you want. It's bad because a lot of what you want to write about is on somebody else's beat. You have to go beat up the police reporter or the school board reporter or the medical reporter to get to do your stories. Um, so about, I would say 80 to 90% of the stories that I write are stories that I come up with the idea. It's sometimes it's something off the news, it's sometimes it's something off my life. A lot of times I suck off my kids' lives or my husband's lives. Um, but it's stories that are out there in our communities that are everywhere. And that's what I want to talk to you guys about today. I was gonna, I'm going to give you 20 tips that your editor won't tell you. Um, if you don't have a handout, Ryland will bring you one. You can raise your hand. Ray, help out there. Sorry. Um, the story, the tips um, are all ones that I've used to find stories at the St. Pete Times. So since I'm a storyteller and it's a storyteller summit, what I'm going to do today is tell you guys 20 stories. Um, I'm going to tell you the tip and then how I got the story and then I'll tell you a little bit about the story and show you the photos that ran with it in the paper. I am a very, very informal person. I, I move around and talk with my hands a lot. If you guys have questions in the middle, just raise your hands. Um, I'll try to leave some time at the end for questions too, but just jump in anytime if you have questions. All right, so today we're going to talk about how to find story ideas. How many of you guys in here think you're normal? <laughs> You're the one I'm worried about right there. <laughs> when I'm looking for story ideas, I try to find the abnormal in the normal and the normal in the abnormal. And that is really my way I operate. Um, my story ideas, a lot of them come just from everyday walk of life. And I guarantee you guys, when you leave here, you will find a couple things that you want to write about. So Tucker, you want to hit it? All right, tip number one is talk to strangers. What? Uh, be a nosy neighbor. Sit by the old woman on a swing. I live in a little town called Gulfport where we have little benches and swings everywhere. And there's always some lonely old person sitting there by themselves. And you would be surprised how many times you can walk up to somebody and say, hey, I'm a storyteller. I'm a writer. I bet whatever story you have is a lot better than the story I'm working on right now. What's your story? I mean, that's really the only thing you have to ask people is what's your story? And you'll be so surprised how many people will open up and just share. There's, how many people have ever been asked that? I mean, every, that's a gift, right? What's your story? What's the story of your life? Everybody likes to talk about that. So that is my first icebreaking question always. What's your story? And this story is one you guys can do anywhere you are. Um, I was doing a, a lot of times too. I don't know how many of you guys are journalists in here. So you guys all, oh good, that's awesome amount. Part of you guys probably know a lot of times one story will lead to another, right? You go out on one story and then all of a sudden you find four others you didn't think about. And you have to be Always on call. I think being a reporter is like being a paramedic. When something happens, you gotta be willing to go. And sometimes there's gonna be a better fire over here than the one they're sending you to over there. So don't be afraid to follow the story rather than whatever the assignment is sometimes. Um, this story came from a story I was doing at the University of South Florida. 
it was the first time they had offered a um, college course for people with learning disabilities. So there was a whole class full of kids with Down syndrome and cerebral palsy. And I was asking them, you know, what's the best thing you've learned in college? What's the best thing about this class? And they all, without an exception, said, I learned to ride the bus. And I thought, oh, who said, oh, that's what I thought. I was like, oh, it seems like such a small thing, you know, but what an amount of independence for a 19, 20, 25 year old to be able to ride the bus and not have to wait on mom or dad to take him somewhere. So I started talking to these kids and they said, well, Mr. Shepard, you know, he came in and taught us how to ride the bus. Every public transportation system has a trainer whose job it is, is to teach you how to use the subway, the bus system, the tram system, whatever it is. They're paid by our tax dollars and they will take you whether you're old or blind or infirm or have learning disabilities and they'll set up a route for you and show you how to get from point A to point B. So whatever city you live in, whatever town you live in, you could do this story. I just met this guy, his name is Mark Shepard. I met him at, um, at dawn one morning when he started his day and he was picking up this woman at the home for unwed teenage mothers and he was trying to teach her how to take her baby to the pediatrician. So that was the engine of the story, you know, is this lady going to be able to navigate these buses and these transfers and figure out how to get her baby to the doctor? And so this is him teaching her how to read this, the bus schedule. Oh, that baby was so cute, he was like three weeks old. Um, and we went until she was able to do it. He would take her back again and again until she knew how to transfer, where to transfer, where to get off. And then this next guy we met in the afternoon was a 23-year-old guy who had Down syndrome and he had gotten a job as a bagger at a public store. But between his apartment where he lived and the public store he worked, there were two other publixes. So he kept getting off at the wrong grocery store and getting all confused. And um, <laughs> he'd been working with this guy for about three weeks. So we had two kind of narratives going, you know, is this kind of guy going to be able to make it to Publix? And he did at the very end. He said, is this where I pull the bell? And Mr. Shepard said, pull the bell. And he gave him a high five because he was able to do it. So it was a very, very small victory, but a huge thing. And that was from talking to strangers in that class, you know, and riding the bus is a great way to get story ideas. There are people who ride the bus that you will never run into in your other walks of life. I mean, I sit there and complain about bringing home four bags of groceries and two teenage boys, but you see those ladies with nine bags of groceries and three toddlers, and they have a story. That is a different story. And all of those, you know, having somebody on the bus, they're your captive audience, too. I mean, until they have to get off at their stuff, you can walk them in on that seat and ask them their story. They're right there. <laughs> um, okay, and there's, there's links on all these stories if you want to go back and read them. They're online. Um, okay, tip number two is play hooky. Most of my story ideas come when I'm not looking for them. If they send me out to find a story, I usually come back with something kind of lame. If I go out and take the kids to a car show, or I go and take the kids to the zoo, or we just go hang out on the beach for the night, I always come back with a story. There's always something interesting in the world going around us. Um, let somebody else drive, or take a different route to work. Walk, ride your bike, go a different way. You see the world in a totally different way. Um, and Look at the places that you go all the time. I bet you'll see something new out there that you take for granted that you could explore as a story. Okay. Um, okay. This story I got on my way home from work one night. I stopped at the convenience mart to buy beer. And I'm, in the, I'm like in the beer cooler with my six pack and this guy is at the counter where the dude is selling you know, lottery tickets and cigarettes. He's like, how you doing tonight, man? And the guy goes, I am having the best day of my life. I can't remember the last time I heard anybody say that at all, much less the poor dude up in lottery tickets, you know. So I go, put my beard down, I'm like, dude, the best day of your life? Really? What happened? And he started telling me the story. Um, when he was 19 years old, in 1967, he got his girlfriend pregnant. And he was 17 years old. And his girlfriend was 17 years old. And her parents made her give up the baby for adoption. He never got to see the baby. He, the girlfriend broke up with him. He hitchhiked his way across the country, wound up on the streets of Kate Asbury you know, during the 60s, or during the, yeah, the 60s. And he had been homeless, he'd been an alcoholic, he'd been living on the streets, and he finally got clean and got this job at the Convenience Mart and got a phone number for the first time in 20-something years. And that morning that I walked into that Convenience Mart to buy beer, his daughter had called and tracked him down. His daughter was my age, she was 42 years old, and she said, I think you're my father. And he was like, oh my God, you know, this is the most amazing thing that had ever happened to him. So she said, I want to come and meet you, and I want to bring mom. And he was like, really? For, you do? And she said, yeah, for Father's Day. So he's telling me this story in the convenience mart, and I'm like, 
can I come? You know? <laughs> and it's like, all you gotta do is ask, you know? Most of the time the people are like, sure, you know? So we went with Mike Turbay. This is him in the Tampa airport. He's waiting for his uh, girlfriend from 40 years ago to show up with his daughter who he's never met. There was all this turbulence and the plane couldn't land. And so he's sitting there like, oh man, after all this, he's got his two bouquets of flowers. He's like, oh, they're not gonna show up. And then, ta-da, that's his daughter on the escalator and that's his girlfriend. She's beautiful, she's like 60 years old. And um, it was just a Father's Day story. It became the front page Father's Day story because I listened when I stopped to get beer. <laughs> you know, that was not a hard tip to follow, but I think we just have to train ourselves to be out there and listening for these stories, you know, and not be afraid to just ask somebody, dude, I overheard you. I, I wasn't trying to eavesdrop, but I did. You know, that sounds like a good story. Um, tip number three is read the walls. This one is guaranteed to pay off. There are stories everywhere out there in our communities on the bulletin boards at Panera, at the libraries, at dry cleaners, at music shops, you know, we'll teach tuba lessons in your home and you just pull off that little stick and there you go, you know. Um, my first story that I ever, ever won an award for was because I was in the vet and there was this sign on the bulletin board and it said, uh, we'll scoop poop in your yard. And I was like, awesome, you know, <laughs> come and clean up after my dog. And then my next I was like, Geez, oh man, who would want to do that, you know? So I called the guy up. He had always wanted to own his own business, and he was awesome. He, he dressed in all dog do brown. Everything he wore was brown. And he could, like, tell you, like, ooh, the schnauzer had a friend over yesterday, you know? <laughs> he just, like, great details follow this guy around. Um, and the other thing that reading that goes along with Read the Walls is, is bad papers. Those little shoppers, those, those little community papers, those little things that anybody can put an ad or a flyer in, they don't know what they have. They don't know it's a great story stuck in a brief on the bottom of B12. So mind those things, you know. I live in St. Pete, God's Waiting Room, they like to call it, right? Mike, did they call it? God's Waiting Room. So I subscribe to like 27 old folk assisted living facilities newsletters. Because you never know what's going to be in there. You know, one day Mr. McGillicuddy was going to go skydiving for his 95th, 95th birthday. And I'm like, really? And it was a little brief. And so we called him Mr. McGillicuddy. And sure enough, he like jumped out of this plane, landed, and false teeth popped out, boom, across the runway. And it was like the greatest moment, you know. But that was from reading this assisted living facility little hand thing. High school papers, college papers. You guys have a good college paper. But a lot of the college papers, you can find great stories for your community in those papers because they don't really know what to do with them sometimes. Not the alligator, but a lot of the little ones. Bathroom walls, too? Bathroom walls. Great story ideas in bathroom walls. They brought one home from their school the other day. I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> Middle school on the walls. Um, the other thing, you can go next one. The other thing about Read the Walls is, is our own papers. Um, briefs, classified ads, police blotters, all those little items that someone gets called in over the scanner and doesn't have time to look into what it is. Um, I'm always looking for those, and sometimes I pull them out and leave them in another folder to go back to. And some of them might go, dude, wasn't there anybody re on duty last night to report this story? Um, this was a story that was in uh, our Monday paper. It was a little tiny brief at the bottom of the, you know, the metro section. And it said that this 53-year-old lady had gone out on her deck to smoke a cigarette and disappeared. And uh, I was just intrigued. Like, how does that happen? You know, she lives in this little mobile home park where there are lots of neighbors all close by. And so I told my editor that next morning, I'm like, I'm really kind of curious about, about this woman, Mrs. Tanner. And he's like, well, why? We have people missing all the time. And I said, yeah, but usually we write about them like that, you know, when they disappear. And then we write about them when they get found. Either they're dead or they're alive. But what about that middle part? What if you're that husband or those kids or the parent of that person? And you don't know if they're alive or dead or what to do. Should you go out with the sheriffs and the bloodhounds? Should you wait for the guy in the helicopter to call you? What do you do? So I convinced my editor that with a couple paragraphs of statistics about missing people and how many were returned alive versus dead, that we could do that middle part of the story about waiting and hoping and wondering and being frightened and not knowing what to do. So this was a guy named Mark Tanner whose wife had walked away. And it turns out she had mild schizophrenia. And she had gotten confused and wandered into the woods. And uh, we hung out with him for two days while they looked for his wife. And uh, thank goodness there was a happy ending. They found her. She was very, very dehydrated and disoriented. But I was worried we'd have to write an unhappy ending. And it was a great relief for all of us. But you know, that was a story that came out of a little police brief that we probably never would have followed in the paper otherwise. Because um, they're in there all the time like that. You know? <laughs> OK, 
Tip number four, sit the bench. You can click through them. Yeah. Um, I think there's two kinds of reporters or journalists in general, photographers too. There's people that go into the room and this is like me, I want to ask you everything. I want to sit you down and get into your brain and your heart and ask every single question I can think of. And then there's reporters that will go into a room and they will just stand there and they'll watch and they just write things down. My friend Diane Tennant, you don't even know she's there. She's so awesome about disappearing into the walls and people forget she's there and so then she can record the scene as it happens, as it goes along without changing it. Whereas I'm always like, wait, what about this? You know? So I think once you know which side of that spectrum you're on, you should really force yourself to try to go the other direction some. I must tell myself to shut up about 50 times during an interview. Shut up, Lane, shut up, Lane. Let it happen, let it happen. And I write my questions down the side of my notebook so I can come back to them. Because you don't want to forget them, right? You're interviewing someone and you know you want to ask a follow-up question or come back to something. But if you stop somebody in the middle of their narrative, sometimes you lose what they would be telling you otherwise. So if you're that fly on the wall person, make yourself dive in and ask hard questions. If you're that soak up a scene and vacuum everything, make yourself stand back and let it happen for a little bit. Um, some of the best reporting actually comes from just observing, from not asking questions at all. And a lot of times I think that we learn things that we never even thought to ask, you know, by just watching and waiting. Um, this was a story that I did a couple years ago. It was actually a Mother's Day story. This little girl was 13 and she was turning tricks for crack on the street. She'd run away from a foster home and she ends up in a hospital to have a sonogram because she finds out when she's in jail that she's pregnant. And so she's having the sonogram and she's really nervous and worried and this lady, Amy Chandler, who was about 40 years old, who had five kids of her own, came in and she said, honey, you know, are you okay? You look really upset. Do you want me to go get your mom? And this little girl, Lily, says, I don't have a mom. Do you want to be my mom? Do you want to adopt me and my baby? And lo and behold, this lady's like, okay, yeah. I mean, miraculous. She had a two-year-old to a 12-year-old. You can click to the next one. And uh, we got to go with them from the moment that Lily left the hospital with the baby. Uh, the baby had all kind of problems. He was a crack baby until... Click again. This is them. This is her oldest, Amy's oldest son, Austin, who was 12. And the little one, Logan, I love his little face. He was two. Um, and we hung out with this family for about two months just kind of trying to write about how do you teach a girl who's never had a mother to be a mother. That was the idea for this Mother's Day story. And we were able to so completely disappear in this chaotic house with seven kids, including two teenagers and a crack baby and two toddlers, that we would be there for hours and they would forget we were there. So it was a joy to report that story. It was just like sit on the floor in the corner and shut up and let their life evolve, you know. You click there a little bit more. This is it, uh, her in court when they're telling her she's going to lose the baby if she doesn't shape up. This is them getting ready for school one morning, which was a crazy chaotic event. And this is her at the end trying to decide whether she wants to run away or not. Um, she got in trouble for showing the 12-year-old an R-rated movie and inviting her former pimp to come by the house. And so they were putting on restriction and she ultimately did run away and left the baby there. Um, but that story was really one of those, like, sit the bench, just 90% of our reporting was just listening and watching and waiting. Uh, one day she's like, no, you can't come over, I'm sorry, I've got to go grocery shopping. And I'm like, dude, I want to go grocery shopping with you. Seven kids, and she took them all grocery shopping, and she had three baskets, and it was like the most amazing scene you ever saw that I never would have thought to put in that story, you know, if she hadn't said, no, you know, we can't come over. Yes, I can. I want to come. I want to go with you. I did a whole story with a nun who couldn't talk to me because she had to get her poodle groomed. And I sat with this poodle in my lap and drove to the groomer back and forth because I just wanted to be there. You know, when somebody goes to do something, go along for the ride. Be there with them. All right, tip number five. Make freaky friends. I was in the high school band. How many of you guys are in the band? That was such a huge, thank you for admitting that. <laughs> that was such a huge epiphany for me to go from being in all these like honors classes with the smart kids to being in the band with everybody who was so much more fun and from all different walks of life and really getting to have friends from other demographics that I had never experienced before. And I'm married now to a drummer who's, I was just telling Mike, went on the road this morning with his band in a big band bus. 
at age 42. So uh, we have lots of friends who are not journalists, and I think that helps a lot. Um, I think if you just hang out with other reporters or other writers, you're not going to get the slices of life that you want to then write about. So the more diverse your friends are, the more diverse your circle of friends are, the more wonderful stories you're going to find to tell, and different viewpoints to see to tell those same kind of stories. Um, this was a what am I on the wrong page? This was a story that I got actually from a lady who works in the advertising department of the Times. And she came and caught me at my car one day and she's like, I know you don't know who I am, but I know what kind of stories you like to tell and I really think this would be a good story for you. She said, this friend of mine lives in an old folks community in uh, Vero Beach and his wife just died. And he's telling everybody this, this story. And I just think it would make a good story for you. So I went and met him. Okay, so this guy's name is Lee. Uh, this is during the Korean War. I don't know the dog's name. All ways you should get the dog's name for sure, and nobody knew that dog's name because he was long dead. But Lee was a soldier during the Korean War. And Lee liked to dress up like a girl on Halloween. So this is 1957, back from the Korean War. And Lee's going out for Halloween in his pearls and, you know, Barbara Billingsley dress, right? Okay. And then Lee meets this guy named Charlie. Click one more on it. I think he's out of order. Sorry. Okay, Lee meets Charlie Kemp. Charlie Kemp was in Mr. Universe competition with Arnold Schwarzenegger in the early 70s. Charlie is a gay guy. Lee, who dresses up in a dress, is a gay guy. And they meet at a gay bar in Cleveland in like the early 1960s. And they have this wonderful boyfriend-boyfriend relationship for all these years. And in the early 1970s, Lee says to Charlie, hey, I read this thing in the Washington Post. They're doing the first sex change operation at John Hopkins University. And you know what? I've always wanted to be a girl. And Charlie's like, what? You're a gay guy. How can you? You know, this doesn't make any sense. And Lee's like, no, I didn't know you could do this. This is what I really, really want to do. So click back one more. So Charlie says, OK, well, I love you whoever you are. That's Lee. For 50 years after Lee got one of the first sex change operations at John Hopkins, they lived together as husband and wife in this little Vero Beach, Vero Beach gated community where nobody knew their secret. And everyone thought they were the cutest little old Florida couple ever. And uh, Charlie brought Lee all this beautiful jewelry from his travels and, and Lee was just the perfect little housewife and they had canaries. And then uh, Lee dies and Charlie's like, dude, let me show you my wife. <laughs> It starts, I mean, all those years he kept her secret, you know. But this was a story I got because I had friends in the advertising department who were friends with the guy from the neighborhood, whatever. But that's how the stories come to you, you know. They, you have to let people know what kind of stories you like to do um, and just be willing to listen to them. Charlie was a hoot. I, I interviewed Charlie probably seven different times, and every time he'd go, you know, I don't recognize you. I, I don't ever see girls, though. <laughs> he, would just, like, he wouldn't have any connection there. Um, but he, he was wonderful and he would make, he's 83 years old now and every, I think you got one more picture on there. Yeah, every time we go to visit, he'd want us to meet him in the gym and he'd go, take my picture, <gasps> take my picture. <laughs> he was just great. So we gave him a lot of nice portraits of himself at the end of that. All right, tip number six is get a life. This is kind of like Freaky Friends, but it also is be a joiner. Um, I had a great old editor in North Carolina who would say, I'd rather have my reporters in bowling leagues than in junior leagues. And his shtick was like, you know, the people in the Kiwanis and the junior league and the, you know, the Lions Club or whatever, they come to you. You, you know when their fish fries are and their eyeglass collections are and they have their briefs in the paper. But there's all these people in dart leagues and pool leagues and home brewing leagues and quilting leagues and scrapbooking leagues. And if you have an interest like that, join a group. Because then you've got another 10, 12, 15 people on your bowling team whose lives you can tap into and stories you can hear. And then you can start telling their stories and sharing their stories or looking for similar stories off other people's lives. Um, so this, this was a story I got, or a couple stories. I volunteered with, um, Jeff Klinkenberg spoke yesterday, right? Jeff and I volunteered for a couple years at the Holocaust Museum, which is right by the St. Pete Times. And our job was to help these Holocaust survivors write their memoirs. And they all came in wanting to tell you the story of their life from 1922 till 2009. And we were like, no, dude, like, pick a little moment, you know. <laughs> pick the time you got bar mitzvah. Pick the time your mom had the one silver candlestick in her purse when you ran away. And they ended up, after two years, writing these incredibly moving, very focused and deep memoirs about their experiences. And so for Holocaust Remembrance Day, I was like, these are too good. I couldn't come up with this on my own. We ran a bunch of their stories. 
Um, this woman's father had been the leading baritone in the Vienna Opera, and he had to leave because he was Jewish, and they sent him on a boat where she watched her best friend die on this boat on the way to America. And um, yeah, there's a couple more. This lady was left in an orphanage, a Catholic orphanage with nuns when she was four years old. Her mother taught her how to genuflect and do the sign of the cross and put the water on. And she didn't know she was Jewish until her aunt rescued her when she was like nine. A founder came and found her at this Catholic orphanage. And she ended up heading up the Tampa Day School for Jewish people. But you know, th these people I met because I was volunteering. And their stories were way too powerful to not run in the paper. They were just am amazing people. That's it. Oh, no. This guy was the only Gentile in the group. His father and mother had been killed for harboring Jewish people in their basement. And at 12, him and his sisters were on their own with their dog walking through the streets looking for shelter. All right, tip number seven. Ignore important people. Okay, if you guys sat me in the room with Johnny Depp for 10 minutes, I would be really excited. But I could not imagine anything I could ask him that he's not been asked. Or any answer that he would give me that he hasn't already told Joan Rivers and Us Magazine or whatever else is out there, you know. I think now it's a curse. When I get assigned to write about an important person, I'm like, oh, geez, do I have to, you know. And I kind of came up with this method. Wait, I did. I'll show you guys this, because you can use this for anything. If you guys are still in school, you can use this to get out of assignments you don't want to do. <laughs> don't listen, Dean, over here. <laughs> okay, so what I do is, you can click on the picture there. Click on the next picture. Okay, so this is an assignment right about Miss St. Petersburg. She's coming to the Miss Florida pageant, and we want you to do a profile on her. Miss St. Petersburg is very pretty, and she's very nice, and she's very sweet, and she's been the runner-up in Miss Florida two years in a row already. So we've already done profiles about Miss St. Petersburg. We know she's nice and pretty and wonderful. I did not want to hang out with the beauty queen. <laughs> I did not want to do this story. Um, so I, I think they gave me this story on a Wednesday. It was due on a Friday. So I did this thing, and you guys can totally steal this idea. I put Miss St. Pete like in the middle of a circle, like that, right? And then I start brainstorming, like riffing around. Who else has some kind of stake in this story? I like that word stakeholders. Who else is a stakeholder in the story that has something to do with Miss St. Petersburg that could open that door to Miss St. Petersburg, but I wouldn't have to tell the story about Miss St. Petersburg, right? So I made like rays on a sun or spokes on a wheel, and I started going around in a circle and trying to think of all the people that I could get to that would get me to her. And the first one I thought about was her mom. Because Miss St. Petersburg, this is the last year she could be in the Miss America pageant. She was getting too old. And what's it like for your beauty queen daughter? I mean, she'd been like the John Bonet Ramsey like since she was three in beauty pageants. What's that like for that mom to have her daughter age out and never have made it past runner-up for Miss St. Petersburg? Um, but mom lived in Georgia, and I wanted to go interview somebody in person. I, I would much rather do my interviews in person if I can. So the next person I thought of was um, the personal trainer. Because this was their first year that they were going to have two-piece bathing suits and all the girls were really worried about their abs. So I called the personal trainer. I said, hey, can I come watch you know, Miss St. Pete work out and talk about getting her ready and blah, blah, blah. He's like, oh, yeah, that'd be great. I'd love to have you. He goes, but I'm secretly sleeping with her. And I don't want anybody to know that. So I'm like, well, I, <laughs> I can't do that. I can't like, not write that if I know that, you know? So that was out the door. So then my other idea, <laughs> he was pretty hot too, but. Uh, um, the other idea I had that I still want to do one day is I was thinking about like all these girls, all these skinny girls who are all on diets for this pageant and there's some poor schlep who's the caterer who's got to like make you know julienne carrots for four days in a row. I don't know. Like, What do you cook for a beauty pageant if you're the caterer? So I called the caterer up to ask him that question. He's like, yeah, that's funny. No. <laughs> he did not want to play along. He did not want to do that story. So I finally... Um, I kept riffing and riffing and I, what I, my last resort usually is like try to put myself in that person's place, in that person's shoes. I could not imagine being a beauty queen ever. I have no idea what that world is like. But I was thinking, okay, I'd, I'd do pretty good on the interview. I could probably ace the interview. I maybe would come up with some flute song or something for some talent that would stink, but I would not know where to go to get an evening gown. I haven't bought an evening gown since prom. You know, like where do you go to buy an evening gown for a beauty pageant? So I called the lady up who was organizing the pageant and I said, hey, I like to go shopping with Miss St. Petersburg, you know, when she goes to pick out her dress. And she goes, oh my, oh, we do not leave that to our girls. That is far too important decision to let them pick out their own clothes. We have a Svengali. We have a dresser. We have this guy named Alan Brown who works at the Waffle House. <laughs> And 
him and his partner, he's a gay guy too, they live in this little bungalow and for like 12 years he's been the coach of the Miss St. Petersburg's. And he took her shopping, he's not ogling her, he's like telling her, you know, you look fat in that dress, you look great. Um, but he would take her back to his house and he had, his whole room was covered in like eight by 10 glossies of former beauty queens that he'd helped. And he had game tapes, like when you watch a football game tape or a baseball game, he'd be like, all right, this is Miss Texas when she screwed up the baton twirl. Here's what you don't want to do, you know. And he knew these stats like, you know, Miss North Carolina hasn't been blonde since 1987. And he would like tell them all this stuff. And he was so funny and he was so nice and he was so knowledgeable and I wrote the whole story through his eyes it starts out like give me the keys like he's, he's wanting to drive her there and and was able to get to Miss St. Petersburg through him you know and it was a much more fun story than watching her be beautiful okay yeah um, tip number eight celebrate losers we always write about the people that win the lottery the people that make the football team the people whose dreams come true I think the people whose dreams don't come true are a lot more interesting and the stories are a lot richer. I have a cousin who all she wanted to be since she was six years old was a professional cheerleader. And when she did not make it, oh, I think she went to Florida State, by the way. <laughs> when she did not make it as a professional cheerleader, she didn't know who she was. Well, who am I? What am I going to do now? That's all I've ever seen myself as a, a cheerleader. So when you can find people like that who are trying to redefine themselves or regroup after losing a lottery, losing a house, losing a spouse, losing a football game, whatever it is, that's a rich place to mine somebody emotionally for a story. Um, this was a story about a guy named um, Daryl Blackwell. And Daryl one night is, can't sleep and he's got insomnia and he's Googling his father's, his name, which is also his father's name, on the internet. I guess we've all done that, right? Well, he finds this thing that pops up from the Washington Post archives that he didn't know if he should pay for or not. Finally, he's like, dude, well, maybe that is my father. So he pays for the thingy. And it's a story about how his father, okay, he, he grew up with a younger sister who was three years younger than him. And he was always told that her twin died in crib birth, like a, what's it called, um, crib, crib death? Um, I couldn't think of that word, sorry. And so that she, he never knew her, that she, the twin sister died of, of crib death. So he sees in this article that Daryl Blackwell Sr. was just um, charged with murder for murdering his baby sister. And he never knew this. You can click on it. This is Daryl Blackwell Sr. who was in the Air Force. This is during the Vietnam War. Apparently he was like a raging alcoholic and had a horrible temper and one night this baby starts crying, crying and screaming and he throws her on the ground and bashes her head up and on the floor. But the Air Force didn't prosecute on the courts. They prosecute in, under the Air Force system. So he never did any jail time. And Daryl never knew this, that his father was a murderer and his sister was murdered, not died in the crib. So he was going to go on this um, expedition, that's mom and dad, he was going to go on this expedition to Arlington National Cemetery to have his father exhumed because he thought, how can this guy be buried with honors in Arlington National Cemetery when he killed his own daughter? So I went with him on this sort of this quest to right this wrong and the Pentagon people just laughed at him and the Air Force people just told him to go away. They were no way were they going to dig up their decorated guy. They didn't care what he'd done or what the Washington Post said. So Daryl then, you know, his quest didn't work. I mean, it would have been a totally different story if I got him there when they unshoveled dad and he felt like he got vengeance. But Daryl sat there and just cried and cried and cried. And, and he a, was a big guy, you know, all strong looking guy. And he was just devastated because his quest to right the wrong wasn't going to happen. And what was he going to do next? Um, he's still writing senators and pushing letters, but it, it was like his dream did not come true at all. Um, tip number nine is wonder who would ever. Do you guys remember those commercials um, for Bud Light in like the 90s where they would go, here's to you, Mr. Golf Ball Picker Upper, and here's to you, Mr. Wrestling Costume Designer, and you'd be like, I'd be driving down the road cracking up, and I'd be like, dude, who does design Hulk Hogan's costumes, and why? Like, what? how does that happen, you know? Um, the one celebrity I would love to be set in a room with, and my kids know this because he's my screensaver, I am in love with Mike Rowe. Do you guys watch Dirty Jobs? I have a huge giant crush on Micro. He has the best job. He has the best idea for an approach to journalism. He's pretty handsome and a great interviewer too. And he just seems like a fun guy. But find, if you guys haven't seen it, what he does is he finds his job that you'd be like, who the heck would ever want to do that job? And he goes and spends one day in the life of somebody doing that job. All of us could do that. Any job you ever think of, of like, who would do that job? There's a story for you right there, whether you fictionalize it or you actually report it. And it is a perfect narrative. It is a beginning and a middle and an end. And you've got a character to follow. And you're in there if you want to do it first person. It's a perfect structure. 
Um, this was a story I did with my kids. We were doing a, um, a travel story at this little, uh, what was it called? Northwest River Ranch? Um, Dude Ranch something? Westgate River, West Ranch. River Ranch Dude Ranch. It's like a kind of a Disney fud timeshare, you know, like a Dude Ranchy thing. And they want us to go do a, a travel story and take the kids. <laughs> so on Saturday night, the big giant event at this little Dude Ranch is they have a rodeo. And they give you like, you know, pink lemonade and cowboy boot shaped glasses and all this <laughs> cheesy stuff. So we're watching the rodeo and they're playing the Lee Greenwood, you know, God bless the USA. And the four horsemen come up across the rodeo stage. And the first guy is carrying a flag that says God, and the next one has bless, and that guy has the, and this guy has USA. And me and the boys just got the giggles. We just were like, it was so, they were like, mommy, that's so funny. Like, this guy gets to be God. This guy's blessed, you know, like, this guy's Mr. America, you know. And they're like, who's the poor schlep who has to be the, the guy, you know. So like, all weekend we're laughing about the, the guy, but it just, that was a, became our catchphrase. And I went back and I turned to my travel story and I told my editor, and I'm like, well, the only thing I didn't get answered was who's the, the guy? And he's like, what? And I was like, oh yeah, we were just kidding around about the, the guy. He goes, oh, you gotta go back and find the, the guy. <laughs> Really, I had not conceived of it as a story. It was just like one of those family jokes you start laughing about, you know? So I, I, we went, I took the photographer and uh, I called the guy. <laughs> <laughs> it actually it gets better. Um, I called the ranch and I said, hey, you know, I'm from the St. Pete Times. I want to do a story about the guy that carries the death flag. And this guy goes, oh, it was the guy who like ran the thing, you know? Oh, that would be great. That's my son, Grant. Grant is this awesome kid. Grant's an ROTC. He's getting straight A's. He's going to go to the Air Force Academy. Grant is a wonder. He's going to get out of this cowboy life and make his old man proud. He's like, you should come write about Grant. <laughs> so I came with the photographer to write about Grant. And we met Grant for breakfast. And he said a little blessing over our eggs. And then he went and hung out with the cows and the cowboys. And we followed him around. And then this other guy was with him named Ike. OK, I, could, I swear I could not make this up, right? Ike has the black hat on. <laughs> Grant has a white hat on. We follow them. Ike's the guy who's like shoveling the cow poop while Grant's like opening the gates. Okay, that's, that's kind of how their relationship went. So we have like half an hour between when we're done reporting and when the rodeo is going to start where they all go back to get dressed. So me and the photographer go to get a piece of pizza at this little deli. And this dude Ike comes up. He's like, hey, you know, do you mind if I ask what y'all are doing here? I've seen you here all day following Grant around. You know, what are you doing? We're like, oh, you know, we're from the St. Pete Times. You know, we're doing a story about the guy who carries the love flag. And he goes, oh, that explains it. And we're like, what? <laughs> what? What's going on? He goes, well, for the past 11 years, I've been the the guy. But tonight, they told me to let Grant carry the the flag. <laughs> He's usually blessed. Grant is blessed, OK? I'm like, you got it. I'm like, what? These rodeo people juked me over the the guy? <laughs> like, like, not even like processing that. So I remember my editor was at a dinner party and I had to run up to the top of this hill at the dude ranch because I couldn't get cell phone reception. I'm like, Mike, Mike, they lied to me. It's not the the guy. And he goes, well, then go find the the guy. <laughs> so like, me and the photographer are running backstage at the rodeo talking to like the clown guy, the bull rider guy, the girls on the horseback. We're like, who's the the guy? Ike. Who's the the guy? Ike. Who's the the guy? Ike. And every single person said it was Ike. So at this point in time, the photographer's about to kill somebody because he's taking pictures of Grant all day long and now it's dark, right? <laughs> so I'm like, oh, this is unbelievable. They would lie about this. So at the end of the rodeo, the photographer no, that's the last one. The photographer gets on the, the loudspeaker thingy with the announcer and he goes, would Grant and I please report to the ticket booth? <laughs> and he takes one picture of them. <laughs> that was it. And I was like exactly what you would think that that guy would be, okay? He was like 35 years old, total beer drinker, lived with his girlfriend and four kids in a trailer with dogs and cats and you know he was like the the guy what you would expect and he kept going oh no right about Grant he's a good kid he's a good kid and the last line of the story was uh, no Ike this is about you you're the genuine article <laughs> all right and tip number 10 is my very favorite tip of all hang out at bars even if you do not drink, you can find a coffee bar or you can go have a Diet Coke at a bar. You don't want to do like, like Starbucks and Panera. Those are kind of the really, you know, the mainstream people. You want to go find a dive bar or a snotty martini <coughs> bar or a hip hop -y bar or some kind of different kind of a bar. And um, once you know people at a bar, like you have a cheers, my bartender knows, okay, Lane's going to want a rolling rock and she's going to want a story. And she has a stack of my business cards under the bar. That when, you know, she'll be like hearing they, bartenders and uh, hairdressers and barbers. 
they hear everybody's stories. So if you can g just leave a stack of your cards or your phone number with those people in your lives, they'll start bringing stories to you. I mean, it's amazing how many stories my friend the bartender has tipped me <laughs> off on. Because she'll just hear people talking and be like, oh, my friend Lane would love to do that story. Here, you should call her. Or let me get your email. I'll have Lane send you an email. You know, it really works it for you. So this is a story that I did from a little bar. I live in Gulfport, a little town uh, south of St. Pete. It's kind of a cheesy little waterfront town. We have our own casino. Um, and we had a little bar called Buddies until Buddies got shut down. But I would stop by Buddies a lot of time on my way be before home, you know, be when I left work, before I had to go get the kids, and just have a beer and listen to people's stories. So this guy's name is Bingo Bob. If you ever have a guy with a nickname, it makes a better story. You know, Bingo Bob's mom owned a bingo parlor, so he was Bingo Bob. He was an unemployed electrician, and I think he was 57 years old. And he was in a band called Bacon Fat. And uh, <laughs> that's a great name, isn't it? They played at this bar called Buddies for Beer. They never got paid, they just paid for buckets of beer, you know? So I'm in there one night and everybody's being like, oh God, Bingo Bob, that's great, congratulations, let me buy you a beer, Bob. And I'm like, what's going on? Oh, I'm about to have the biggest day of my life. Again, it's like the convenience store guy, you know? Unemployed electrician having the biggest day of his life at Buddy's Bar, okay. I gotta hear that story, right? So he tells me he's in this band and the, there's a band called, you guys might, well, you guys are probably too young. Do you remember Molly Hatchet? You remember that hit band? So Molly Hatchet, which has one guy left from the original band, they're like a metal band from the 70s that never was very big, they're going to come play the Gulfport Casino in our very own hometown. And Bingo Bob's favorite band ever is Molly Hatchet. And Molly Hatchet said, find us a local band to open for us and do our sound system. And they picked Bingo Bob's Bacon Fat. They're going to open for Molly Hatchet. And it's like the hugest day of his life, you know? So I was like, well, can I hang out with you? And he goes, Sure, whatever. You know, so we meet him in the morning. I'm like, what are you going to wear? I asked that total girly question. He goes, oh, I bought a new black t-shirt. <laughs> this is him in his new black t-shirt. He goes and they set up the casino, all the sound system and stuff. Oh, and again, they weren't going to get paid, okay? They were just going to get to open for Molly Hatchet, but they were going to get to party on the band bus after. They're going to get to party with Molly Hatchet on the real touring band bus. So he got, he, they set up all the equipment. He goes, I gotta go unwind for a couple hours. I'm like, can I come with you? You see my trend? I always just want to be with them. Sure, whatever. So he goes back to his apartment and for two hours he plays Donkey Kong. And the photographer's like, really, Lane? <laughs> really? <laughs> so finally they go, they do their concert, they're awesome. Molly Hatchet plays their concert, whatever. They go to, to pack up all the equipment and stuff, waiting to go out and party on the band bus. They pack up all their, their speakers and their microphones and they go outside, the band bus is gone. They totally dissed them. Molly Hatchet dissed bacon fat. So these guys are like, they're like despondent. Their girlfriends are there, their kids are there, their neighbors are all there to see this, you know. And they're like, dang. So Bingo Bob's girlfriend says, come on, there's 15 minutes to last call at Buddy's. And he's like, I don't know, I don't know. She's like, come on, let's go have a drink for last call. So we go back to Buddy's, which is where I met him in the first place. The photographer was like, really, we've been with these people 12 hours. <laughs> Can we just be done? I'm like, come on, last call. So we go back to the bar. And when he walks in the bar, Bacon Fat walks in the bar, everybody stands up on the chairs and tables and gives him a standing ovation. And it was like, that was his face. It was like, all of a sudden, Molly Hatchet didn't matter anymore. He was where he belonged, and he was a celebrity, and it was the biggest day of his life. And the photographer was really glad I, let him, I made him stay, because <laughs> we got this happy ending for him. But, you know, those stories are in bars everywhere you go. And, um, you know, I, I heard a song on the radio the other morning called The Eight O'Clock Pint. It was this great folk song about a bartender who's opening the bar at 8 o'clock in the morning. So I go down to the little bar in Gulfport where we have dollar beer specials at 8 a.m. I'm like, okay, who's down here drinking beer at 8 o'clock in the morning, you know? I'm like, I'm from the St. Pete Times. And they're like, we work at the St. Pete Times. <laughs> it was all the people from the printing press who'd like just gotten off work and they were having their happy hour. <laughs> all right. But you know, all different bars have stories that are waiting for you. All right, this, that was my first half. I know I'm going kind of slow. Do you guys have any questions so far on the first 10 questions? Keep going. Keep going? All right. Um, tip number 11 is give everybody your phone number. We put our numbers in the bottom of our stories, you know, which sometimes is a pain because weirdo people call you, but then sometimes you get really great tips that you never would have thought of. So I don't complain about that anymore. Um, but I also, besides bartenders, I give my card to, you know, the lady who watches our dogs. I give my card to the guy who is at the gas station. I gave my card one time, I swear, to the lady at the subway sub shop. And just, you know, she was like, because she saw my badge and she's like, oh, you work at the same time. I'm like, yeah, do you ever have any stories? Three years later, she calls me. She goes, 
I know you don't remember me. I made you a turkey and Swiss sandwich one day. <laughs> she totally remembered. And she's like, I had this great story. And it was. It was an awesome story. And it was just because I left the lady at the subway shop, you know, my card. Um, this story was the story that won the Pulitzer Prize last year. This was the girl in the window. And it came from a tip from a PR person. Um, a lot of PR people, you don't want to hear what they have selling at you. But if you train them, if you tell them what kind of story you want to do and what you're interested in, they can be your best friends. And they will find things. Like I told them, I don't want to write a story about, okay, they're hanging up a bunch of pictures of, of kids who need to be adopted at the mall. I don't want to write that story. That's a brief, <laughs> maybe at the most. But if you have a kid who's up to be adopted, who has a really amazing story, or you have a kid who's getting adopted and there's a good story in that family, call me and let me know. I'd like to write that. It took about two years. And she called me um, in January of 08. And she said, um, there's this little girl who was left in a room. Uh, it wasn't really a room. It was like a garage with the door closed off. And she was found on this mattress covered with roaches, covered with feces, dog feces, animal, human feces. It, it, the grossest thing, the policeman who carried her out was in tears. He'd never seen something so pathetic. She spent a year in the hospital and in medical foster care trying to get her well. And they called her the feral child. <laughs> because as far as they could tell, she'd never been held, never been loved. As Mike said, the neighbors didn't even know she existed. She'd been locked away in this room by herself. At age seven, was still wearing a diaper. Couldn't speak, <coughs> couldn't feed herself. Uh, was totally terrified of people. And lo and behold, you can click through there. Oh, let's go again. This, this amazing family from Fort Myers saw her picture at GameWorks during one of these heart gallery exhibits where they put up a bunch of pictures of kids who can be adopted. And they didn't know anything about her. And they fell in love with this face and they decided that she was their daughter. And the guy had a dream that God was handing him to her. And they took in this little girl and, um, I mean, she couldn't brush her teeth, she couldn't turn on the faucet, she couldn't do anything. And we got to follow them for about six months as we tried to, this is what she would do, she would like bat things like an infant, you know, when you put them on a play mat or whatever. That was about where she was at. Um, and we followed them for about six months as they tried to kind of humanize her, I guess, in a way. So, I mean, the, the question was, can love and caring and humanity make up for a lifetime of neglect? And um, we, we watched them potty train her and uh, te teach her to eat ham. And, you know, she stopped having these tantrum, taper tantrums so badly. And um, she never did learn to talk, um, but she just became a whole different person by the time we saw her. Sure. Yeah, she could make sounds, and they were trying to teach her to sign a little bit, but she didn't even have, like, pincer grasp, you know, because if a kid doesn't get that stimulation when they're a baby, all those neural pathways get lost or blocked and, and atrophied, and so they're not sure what she's ever going to be capable of, but she's so much happier and well-adjusted now and can at least do things like, you know, get herself a glass of water when she wants to and not poo herself anymore and, you know, let them, she knows how to open a book and all that kind of stuff, which she had no clue of before. So this was the, the beginning of the story started when the um, neighbors saw the face in the window and they didn't know if it was a ghost or an angel because she was so pale and emaciated. And the end of the story was every night she asked her dad, to, well, she went like this to get her dad to lift her up because she wanted to look out the window at the sunset. So she ended the night every night looking over the beach at the sunset out her window. That's, that story got more than a million hits on our website and it got picked up in like 30 different papers across the world. It was translated into... Arabic and Hebrew and Japanese and it was just it, it was amazing the life that story got but I think it was because it was such a basic question of humanity you know like what what happens if you don't give a child any kind of love or support um, okay tip number 12 is be late I know your journalism professors are not going to hear this and you cannot get out of covering the news just for the record but sometimes if you wait a day a week a month a year on a story, you're going to get a much better story. You're going to get a much fuller and richer story when that person is out of crisis, able to process what happened to them, and talk to you about it. Um, this was a story that uh, was a couple years ago. Our, the city manager of um, Largo, Florida, had been the city manager there for 14 years, Steve Stanton. And word gets out that Steve Stanton is about to have, uh, there's a theme in my stories here, about to have a sex change operation. And so the city council uh, reporter for Largo covered that story and covered the meeting when they fired him, basically for lying to them, for saying that he was a man when he wanted to be a woman. I don't know what their logic was, but they fired him, and that was our news page. And I waited two days and went back and I said, 
he said to the, at the council meeting, you know, I've known since I was five years old that I should be a girl. And I said, I want to do a story about the last 35 years of your life. What is it like to know you're the wrong gender for all your life? And follow, just follow you as you go through this after the crisis happened. I mean, the news was, oh my God, he's going to be a girl. And oh my God, he got fired. But what's the story behind that? You know, that was the part of it that I wanted, that I waited a week or so on. This is at the hearing. Oh, wait, go back one time. This, this books up here were journals he'd kept since he was seven years old. And one page is written in Steve, and one page is written in Susan. He had both voices. My mouth dropped just like yours did when I found out that was there. And he goes, you want to read them, don't you? <laughs> and I'm like, yes! <laughs> like, what a gift, you know? And he goes, okay. And he's a pretty funny guy. And he goes and he like plops three of them in my lap, and I'm like, I couldn't read them at all. I couldn't read his handwriting whatsoever. It was worse than Tom French's. <laughs> it was like his own little language. And I'm like, okay, dude. He goes, what? I go, you got to read them to me. He goes, oh. And he sat there and he read me like four or five of the different entries for each different year. And it was such a gift as a journalist. Oh, he cried and cried. Yeah. So there's, that's the hearing when he gets fired. And then we brokered to be able to be the first news organization that ran Susan's picture. Uh, and I got to go shopping with her when she went and picked out her outfits. And she'd never been in the women's shoe department at Macy's and wasn't sure how that worked. And uh, it was just a very interesting journey, way beyond the news story. You know, that was, that was my getting late. That, this story ran a month after the news story that ran about her getting fired. And then she goes to D.C. to lobby for changes with, uh, on, in Congress um, among discrimination and transgender bills. Uh, okay, wait. tip number 13, work holidays. I know all you journalists already know this. As soon as you start at the bottom of totem pole somewhere, you are going to have to work Christmas, Easter, New Year's, Thanksgiving. Pick your holiday. You're going to have to work one of them. Sometimes they're nice and let you pick what one you want to work, but you're going to have to work one. Um, and so I always try ahead of time to, to think of a new way to tell a story for that holiday that I know. Okay, this year I'm going to do Valentine's Day. Okay, next year I'm going to do Fourth of July. Um, this was la two years ago, I think. I was trying to think of an idea for Mother's Day. We've, all, we've done a million Mother's Day stories. I showed you the one about the mother with the little 13-year-old girl. That was the year before. So then I'm like, okay, there's all different kinds of mothers. You know, there's foster mothers, there's bad mothers, there's goody-goody mothers, there's stay-home mothers. And then I started remembering, I was at the University of Virginia, and when I was in a sorority, we had house mothers. And I started thinking, like, I, they still have that. Like, you know, that was 20 years ago. Does anybody still do house mothers? So I called University of Florida's Greek Council, and they said, oh, Kappa Sig is the only fraternity left that mandates that they have house mothers. And Mimi Howard, who's 84 years old, has been the house mother there for 35 years. And I was like, oh my God, that's amazing, you know? This cute little lady who lived, this is her room. She has this little, like, you know, Beatrix Potter looking room with doilies and lace flowers and all this stuff. And then she comes out to the graffiti wall where the foosball table is. And she lives in the Kappa Sig house. Um, and so I did a Mother's Day story about a mother to 80 drunk college guys, basically. <laughs> <laughs> this is the president of the fraternity who loved her to pieces, called her mom. And then this is her like, making sure they're doing their homework in the hangout room. <laughs> and her, she said her greatest gift that she was going to leave these boys and their future wives with was every one of them had to learn how to do laundry before they moved out of the Kappa Sig house. <laughs> so she's just making sure this guy folded his towels right and is like, has his laundry basket done? But it was you know, a totally different Mother's Day story just because I was bored of all that regular old Mother's Day story. So if you start making yourself think about themes and ideas for holidays, even you guys who are freelancing, any paper is going to need a Mother's Day story. They're going to need a Valentine's Day story. They got to put something there. So if you can come up with a different idea, you will own the front page. Um, this was another Mother's Day story I did. Um, I had this idea about um, taking flowers to your mom on Mother's Day. And um, so I, I don't know, this is kind of sick maybe, but <laughs> I had lost my grandmother-in-law and, and my grandmother both in a year. And I thought, well, this year when we take flowers to them, we're going to take them to the cemetery. You know, we're not going to take them to the old folk home or to their house. So I called the hospice and I said, is there anybody who's lost their mom in the last year that this would be their first mother? Day, first Mother's Day without a mother. They said, oh yeah, this woman here, Tina, she lost her mom and her grandma in the last two months, and she's really having a hard time. She's in one of our support groups. And I said, well, can I talk to her? 
So we went with Tina and I wrote the story like Tina's going to buy flowers for her mom and she has all this stuff to tell her mom and it's been a while since she saw her mom and the last scene you end up at the graveyard with her. So you didn't know at the beginning, you know, but that's what I took the flowers to mom. All right. Tip number 14. Take stories nobody else wants. Again, if you're on the bottom of the totem pole, you're going to get assigned stuff that nobody else wants to do. I made that my mission when I was at a bureau to like take all the crappy assignments and make them into something that somebody else would go, oh, I wish I'd done that story. How'd you get that story? Oh, because it was a press release that nobody else wanted to go do, you know? So you, you can turn it around and make it something special. You don't just assume that it's a crappy assignment, you know? This was a story, um, there was a brief, again, in the paper that the National um, Heart Institute was launching a Go Red campaign. You guys know that, like the, the breast cancer ribbon thing, they were doing a Go Red campaign and wear red dresses for, to combat heart disease. And they teamed up with the Tampa Academy of Design to design um, eight red dresses for these women who had suffered heart disease or heart complications and they were going to have a fashion show and a fundraiser at the end between the design school and the Heart Institute. So nobody wanted to do this story. The medical reporter passed it off to the fashion reporter who passed it off to the higher education reporter who passed it off to some other editor who passed it off to me. And I was like, okay, the story to me was not about this campaign, right? It is not about this fashion show. The story is about who are these women that are getting these dresses made for them that they're gonna go and model. I looked through the list of the nine women. All of them are over 60 years old, except this one girl who's 17 years old, who's had two heart transplants by age 17. And she goes to the academy, they were all get, get to look at sketches for what they wanted their little dress to look like for the fashion show. And she says to the lady, do you think you could have it done in time for me to wear the prom? Because I don't have a dress for the prom. And I just like got the shivers there, this beautiful, beautiful little girl who wanted to wear her red dress to the prom that she was there after suffering two heart transplants. So we hung out with Stacy and her mom and, and the designer of the dress as they put all the you know, the pieces together. And then she was supposed to go to the fashion show and the prom, and our idea was gonna be like, the last scene in the story is when she wears this dress to the prom, and we got permission from her boyfriend in the school and all to be there. Well, in the meantime, her heart started, her body started rejecting her second heart. And they put her back at All Children's Hospital, and they pumped her full of all these steroids, and you see she gained about 50 pounds in two weeks there, because of all the steroids they had her put her on. And she ended up being in the hospital during her prom. All her friends chartered a bus and came and had the prom in the hospital at All Children's for her while she was waiting for this heart to be delivered to her. That story went on the front page. Everybody in the paper was like, oh my God, how did you get that story? And I'm like, remember this press release? <laughs> None of y'all wanted it. You don't ever know where these stories are gonna go or where they're gonna take you. And you have to be able to figure out ways to look in a different window or through a different lens. And they just pop out sometimes like that. About ten of we got five more. Should I keep rolling or do you you got another speaker coming on? Yeah? Okay. You guys have any questions so far? Okay. Um, tip number fifteen is a tip from my wonderful editor Mike Wilson. Look for the bruise on the apple. I, I am like a very hallmarky person. Like when I ever get lose my job in journalism, I'm, I know I'm gonna probably go write Hallmark cards. <laughs> I'm just a very sappy person and I love everybody and I take everybody, I think everybody's got their good intentions at heart. And I need an editor like Mike who'll be like, Lane, really, that guy's full of it. <laughs> you know, like I need somebody to sort of check me and counterbalance me on the other direction. And his tip on look for the bruise, look for the bruise on the apple is, you know, the shinier and more perfect your apple is, the more likely it is not to be real. If you have this beautiful apple that looks like it, it's perfection, it could be wax, it could be wooden, it could be anything but real. But if you turn it over and there's a wormhole or a bruise or some little fingernail mark on the back, you know that it's real. It doesn't make your apple any less wonderful, it just makes it more believable. So Mike always wants me to find something, some kind of bruise on the apple for my people that I'm writing about. And sometimes it's only a paragraph, you know, in a 60 inch story. <coughs> this was a story that I got to write the very last profile on Evil Knievel before he died. Um, one of the ladies who used to work at the paper called me up and she said, oh my God, I'm at SunTrust Bank and there's this old dude pulling an oxygen tank and the bank manager said, Mr. Knievel, can I help you? <laughs> and I was like, oh my God, he's still alive? Like I had no idea he was still alive. Um, so I called him up you know, and, and asked him if I could come over and interview him and he was like, ah, oh, sure, whatever, I'm not going anywhere anyway, you know, come on over. <laughs> And uh, so the photographer and I went over to his house 
And I, I mean, Evil Knievel to me was like an icon when I was growing up. My dad and I watched Wild World of Sports, the Snake River Canyon, the whole thing. I loved Evil Knievel. I had the little doll, you know, that you, remember that? You could do the little motorcycle thing and it would crash into your dining room chairs. I loved that thing. So I was like so excited to meet Evil Knievel. And I go over there and he was the biggest jerk I've ever interviewed in 22 years of newspapering. I've never had anybody be so mean to me. He yelled at me. He told me I was stupid. He said, what kind of business do you have asking that question? And then he said, give me a beer. <laughs> I was like, OK, Mr. Kniebel, where's the beer? You know? And uh, it was like 10 o'clock in the morning. He's like, you better have one, too. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not ready for a beer. But I, I hung out at his house, and I, he made me cry. And I, I called the editor afterward. I was like, Mike, I'm so, that guy was so mean to me. He was screaming and yelling at me and made me cry. My notepad was all filled with tears on it. And he goes, well, did you write it down? And I was like, what? He goes, did you write down what he was yelling at you? Did you write his exact words down when he was telling you you were stupid? I was like, yeah. He goes, well, there's the heart of your, there's your bruise on the apple. You know, everybody thinks Evil Could Evil is this great, iconic sports game, but he's a mean old bastard who never thought he was going to live to be 40, much less 68. He's broken every bone in his body. He can't breathe. He's totally uncomfortable and mean. <laughs> so this, this was the story. We followed him to his last appearance at Evil Can Evil Days in Butte, Montana. This is him waving goodbye to the crowd. He got back on the plane, came back to Clearwater, and died like four days later. Um, but again, I never would have thought of incorporating that you're a stupid, sucky journalist portion of the interview into my story. And, and to my editor, that was what made it. Like, that was like how you as a reader can relate to this guy. Because he was like that to his fans in Butte, too. It was all about, like, what do you like from me? Ah, I'm old man. Um, all right, tip number 16. These are different ways now of looking at story ideas, maybe. This came from my kids when they were little. Lie on the floor and climb on the cabinets. They would always be like up on the counter being like, Mom, the top of the fridge is really dusty. <laughs> and I'd be like, well, I can't see that, you know, but, or underneath the pots and pans and looking at the world from the other direction. And I think that we have to think about that as storytellers. You know, if you, if you think about yourself as a, um, a documentary photographer and you were going to do a story about this room, you could come in with your camera on a boom and zoom over everybody's heads and see their hair and the top of their hats and their glasses. You could run the camera up under the seats and see what people's shoes were or what kind of books they piled beside them. You could paint in really close on Mike's t-shirt and show his face and t-shirt. There's a million different ways you could enter a scene as, with a camera. And there's a million different ways you can enter that scene as a storyteller with a pen and paper. So figure out where it is that you want to go in terms of being the narrator and then own that perspective on the story. Um, my secret guilty pleasure at night after the kids are in bed is I like to have a glass of wine and watch MASH reruns. <laughs> I know that is really geeky. But I think MASH is the very best of all TV drama ever for storytelling. The characters, the plot, the moods they set you in, you know how you're hysterically laughing at one minute and you're crying the next minute. The themes and the world that they embrace. I love, I love MASH. So I'm watching MASH one night um, before Christmas last, last year, two years ago I think. And there's this episode about um, Father Mulcahy, the priest, you know, who's assigned to this mash unit. And Father Mulcahy's in Rosie's bar, and he's having a drink, and he's crying to Rosie about how much it sucks that everybody dumps everything on him as the priest, and he doesn't have anybody to dump it on except for God. And sometimes he wonders if God is listening or cares, or if God doesn't have better things to listen to than Father Mulcahy complained. So it's a story of, about being a lonely priest in the middle of a war. And I started thinking, God, I bet there's hundreds of those over there in Iraq right now. So I called McDill. I mean, this is really my MASH-inspired idea. <laughs> I called McDill. I said, hey, I'd like to talk to a chaplain who's signed up for more than one tour of duty. I don't want somebody who gets assigned there and doesn't want to be there. But do you have anybody who's signed up voluntarily to go on more than one duty? They're like, oh, yeah, I think we have this guy outside of Baghdad. You know, um, I'll see if I can get in touch with him. I'm not sure. You know, um, let, me, let me get back to you. So this is like... I don't know, 4 o'clock on a Friday. Saturday morning, I'm standing in line waiting for Shikra with him at Bush Gardens on the roller coaster line, and my cell phone rings. Hello, this is Major Jeffrey Hawkins live from Iraq. Oh, my gosh. So I sit in Bush Gardens for like an hour and a half while they're riding the roller coasters, and I interview this guy over the phone from Iraq. And he had the most amazing story. He was trying to write the Christmas message to give to his troops. And he said, I don't know what to say to inspire these guys or make them feel better. They're freaking stuck at Iraq at Christmas again. And I have to do this Christmas ceremony. He had laid out, these were all the guys who'd been killed from their unit. He laid out their boots and their photos and their weapons and their helmets around the Christmas tree. The Christmas tree is like here. 
And so he went to remind everybody of what they had lost. And he basically told me the story about how he was trying to think of the perfect prayer to send these guys out into combat on Christmas Eve. And then he cell phone, satellite phoned me pictures of him doing the prayer with the guys. And so this ran on, on Christmas Eve at the St. Pete Times. But it was just really like, oh, Father Mulcahy, there must be somebody else out there like Father Mulcahy, you know. You can get these ideas from TV shows and movies, songs, short stories, novels. There's always somebody in real life you can find that will embody that type of story if you go looking for them. Um, tip number 17 is listen to the quiet. Again, I have a hard time shutting up, <laughs> as you can tell. But I think a lot of times the best stuff in our stories comes when we're just waiting. And we don't even know what we're waiting for sometimes. The, the epiphanies come when the quiet comes, or the dark comes. Um, this was a story, any guys recognize this guy? This is the worst picture up here because I took it. <laughs> this is Jim Cantori, the Weather Channel hurricane hunt guy. And this is during those years we had, Florida had three back-to-back -back hurricanes. And everybody was watching Jim Cantori, and he was like, you know, the voice of the hurricane. And I said, I just want to go hang out with the hurricane hunk during a hurricane. Like, what is it like to be this guy? So um, flew up to Pensacola, where he was. He was hanging out in a day's in. Everybody else had left the beach, you know, because it was a hurricane. So it's me and him and his film crew. Didn't send a photographer with me. This is my phone camera thingy. But I hung out with him as he does his broadcast on the beach. The only other thing open besides the days in was the Hooters next door. And when the Hooters closed, all the little Hooters girls in their tank tops came and brought him all these wings and stuff on the beach. Oh, Jim Cantori, oh, Jim Cantori. So it was this kind of funny moment, you know, like, and the hurricane's burned out. Oh, would you like some wings? You know, so I had this little narrative, you know, about him. And he, he wears, you know, the, all the gear, but then he had these little flip flops on. And so I just had the whole narrative about the hurricane guy, you know, broadcasting from the beach. And that was fine. And um, then it was midnight and he was done for the night. And, and uh, he goes, hey, we're going to go back up to the room and hang out for a little bit. Do you want to have a beer with me? And I'm like, sure, have a beer with the hurricane. Why not? You know? So I go back up to his room with him. And he goes, hang on just a minute. i got to make a phone call. So I'm like sitting on the other bed. This is his camera guy. And he's talking on the cell phone to his wife. I didn't know it was his wife at first. But he's, then he's saying, oh, honey, I'm sorry. You know, is there anything I can do? I'm sorry, honey. No, I don't know when I'll be home. I'm not sure when the storm's going to come, honey. Are the kids OK? Oh, I'm sorry, honey. And he starts bawling. And I'm like, one of those moments where you're like, should I be writing this down? Should I be taking a picture? Or should I be like pretending I don't hear this, you know? But the quiet, the quiet time, he went back to call his wife, comes out that his wife has muscular dystrophy. It's a beautiful woman who's like 36 years old, is confined to a wheelchair. And he's left her alone for the third time, the third hurricane that season, to take care of their kids who are like six and eight. And she's telling him, I went to get the salmon out of the oven tonight and my arms were too weak and I dropped it on the floor and I almost burned the kids and we didn't have anything to eat for dinner. And he's going, I'm sorry, honey, I don't know when I'll be home. And he got off the phone and he goes, I'm sorry you had to hear that. I'm sorry. I said, I'm sorry, I couldn't not hear that. And he goes, well, maybe it's time this comes out. Hang on a minute. And he calls his wife back and he says, there's a reporter here. Can I tell her our story? She's like, let me talk to her. So I got this amazing story, had nothing to do with, you know, I want to be a day in the life of the hurricane guy, about what the storm at home that he was battling while he was waiting for the storm to hit there on the beach. Now, if I'd gone back to my room and hung out with my New Yorker, I never would have gotten that story. You know, that was like being there in the quiet moment when he was winding down his real day with his family. And uh, it went from the bottom of the feature page to the front page and got picked up all over the place because he'd never shared that before. Um, okay. You know, this is, let's skip the next couple here. Well, this, this tip is go along for the ride. I kind of talked about that a little bit, but don't interview somebody on the phone. Don't sit them in front of a desk. Don't buy them a cup of coffee at Starbucks. Go with them, whatever they're doing. If they're taking their dog to the groomer, go. If they're, this was a story, you can go back to the beginning for a second, uh, about a high school girl. We had a little brief in the school notes section of the paper that this high school girl, on the day she graduated from high school, got landed the lead in Hairspray on Broadway, the musical Hairspray. And she was going to be leaving for New York in two days. So it was a little brief. And I was like, OK, I want to go with her. <laughs> I want to go to Broadway with this chick who's never been out of St. Petersburg, who lives with her mom and doesn't even know how to make grilled cheese and has never had a bank account or driven a car. And she's going to go to New York City. And uh, so this is her mom when they're getting her headshots made. And this is her very first night. She'd never spent the night in a hotel by herself before. She'd never been in Manhattan before. She, this is her in the hotel looking out the window being like, oh my god, what did I get myself into? Doesn't know how to hail a cab. Trying to hail a cab. 
This is Bruce Volant. She was the guy from Hollywood Stars, Hollywood Squares, who played her mom um, in the Harvey Firestone role. By the time she got to Broadway, he was the mom in Hairspray. And then this is her mom back home. Her only daughter. Mom's a single mom. Uh, runs an after-school YMCA program. Her mom every night would play her daughter's middle school and high school tapes of her plays to go to sleep by because she was lonely and missed her daughter and wanted to hear her singing the song from Charlotte's Web or whatever it was. And then she finally got to do it. She got to take the lead on Broadway. So we followed her for about eight months until she finally, we went to New York twice. The rest of the reporting was on the phone and emailing with her mom, but we followed her and we knew when she was going to get to take the stage. So we had this like, ta-da moment. But that was like, okay, a brief in the paper versus going to, to Broadway with this chick, you know, you got to be able to follow your story and go, go along for the ride. Um, tip number 19 is play dumb. My old editor in Carolina would go, I'm just a farm boy from Nebraska. I don't know nothing about siphoning off money from no tax dollars account. You know, he would just act like he was the biggest hick because people would try to explain things to him then. And he would get stuff that they wouldn't have ever offered to him otherwise. If you go in acting like you know everything about it, people are going to try to put something over on you. If you go in acting like you know nothing about whatever you're forced to write about, they're going to feel sorry for you. They're going to want to explain it and hold your hand and help you out. Um, this was a story about, wait, this was a, this is the next one. No. Okay. That was the same tip, sorry. That was the goal on for the ride. Oh, no, it wasn't. No, it wasn't. Okay, sorry. This is the play dumb. This is the play dumb, sorry. <laughs> My assistant here. Um, this is a story, again, one of those like stories that led to a story. I did a story about a little girl dying of a brain tumor who wanted to record an Elvis song. And five years after she died, her mom called and said, you should write about my mailman. And I'm like, why? <laughs> and she's like, because he's this great guy, and uh, he just knows everybody on his block, and you should go hang out with the mailman. So I was like, all right, what's a couple hours with the mailman? And I went and hung out with this guy, and um, basically the story was he was in this kind of poor neighborhood with a lot of elderly residents, and he would be walking up to their doorway being like, Oh my God, someone should know this grass is all overgrown with sand spurs and weeds and grass and stuff. And he said one day he's cussing under his breath like, wow, well, somebody should mow this grass. And he heard this voice go, you, you should mow this grass. And he was like, I don't know if it was God or my conscience or my brother playing a trick on me or whatever. He's like, but he went home and he got his little push mower and he started mowing lawns. And by the time I had met him, he was up to mowing 38 lawns a week. All for free, all for these people who lived in his block. You know, so by me following him along and being dumb, like, why is your mailman so great? And just asking all the people, they, he did so many things for these people on his block besides deliver their mail. That's where I got picked up in Reader's Digest. And he ended up getting about $40,000 in gift cards for gas for his lawnmower. Someone bought him a riding mower after that because he was doing a push mower that whole thing, the whole time. Um, all right, my last tip, thank you for hanging in with me, is don't be afraid of yourself. I was absolutely terrified to write first-person stories when I came to the St. Pete Times. I'd been doing this for 15 years. I'd never written a first-person story. Because I always felt like whatever happened in my life was not nearly as interesting or exciting as what was out in the people's lives that I was reporting and writing about. And um, the first story that I wrote as a first-person was that I had taken these boys when they were little. Tucker was four and Rye was five and we'd gone to a wedding in, in uh, Atlanta. And we were, huh? Is that No. We're driving back from Atlanta on 75, and it's pouring rain. I think the kids are asleep, and all of a sudden I hear Tucker scream, Oh, Mommy, it's terrible, it's terrible! Bobo just flew out the window! And Bobo was this little stuffed elephant, you know? Like, when you have your little lovey elephant thing, and Bobo had been his since he was in his crib, and he's, like, in the window like this, and Bobo's, like, on the side of I-75 somewhere in the rain. So I went back to work, and I was telling everybody, like, Oh, my God, you can't believe my silly kid, what he did to me this weekend. And my editor's like, Lane, shut up. Go write that story. <laughs> and I was like, really? Like, I never thought it was a story, but everybody in the room had a Bobo story. Everybody had someone whose kid lost their Raggedy Ann or the teddy bear. We had to go back to Walmart and find G.I. Joe or, you know, whatever it was. Everybody had that kind of story in their life. And when you can touch on something like that, even if it's your own life, <coughs> write about it. If there's something so universal that as soon as you bring it up, everybody goes, me too, then you have a story right there. And the other way around that, too, is if you have a story that nobody's ever heard before and they go, oh my god, really? Then you know you have a story. And this is one of those stories. Did you guys know you can take a houseboat? Even if you do not know how to drive a boat, you can rent a houseboat for a week and go up the Suwannee River. He'd steered it for the whole way. And everybody the was like, oh my god, really? You can do that? So we went back and did a story on that because that was just a vacation that we did. And so these are just... <laughs>
beautiful Swanee River family on the water portraits. The kids had no, no TV, no internet connection for five days either, so we had to like play chess and cards and stuff. But don't be afraid of yourself. You know, all of you guys out there, if I spent 10 minutes with each of you, I know I would have an awesome story. You all have them in your lives. You have them in your hearts and heads. Don't be afraid to share them and write them down, too. Thank you. Yeah.